Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today for the February forecast. My name is Myron Franz, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. And uh, let me get the uh, slide ready here. I'm joined, as, uh, as Keith said, with Dr. Laura Columbakitis, State Economist, and Budget Director Margaret Kelly. Uh, the documents, you should all know, MMB's documents are available online at mn.gov backslash MMB under the tab forecast and updates. So today's forecast, let's, let's go there. I, I Actually, uh, Warren Beatty did not give us this slide, so I think it's accurate. Um, today's forecast marks the seventh, po the, I'm sorry, the eighth positive forecast balance in a row. So as you can see, the forecast balance now shows a $1.65 billion number up from $1.4 billion in November, or a $250 million increase to the bottom line. We also have about $2 billion in cash and budget reserves. Looking to 20 and 21 in our planning estimate, you can see on the chart, we also, we also see a projected planning estimate of $2.1 billion. This is also up since November by $684 million. At the last forecast presentation in December, I said that the forecast was boring because it was just more of the same. Good news, but more of the same. Well, this one is positively boring because it's more of the same, but it's got a nice kicker at the end. So if you look at this forecast balance, one of the things we want to talk about today is what's happened since the Great Recession. And as you know, since the Great Recession, the Minnesota economy has been on a steady recovery. And I want to recognize and applaud the people, hardworking people of Minnesota for the work they, they've done in Minnesota and their confidence in Minnesota. Their financial success is an important part of the state's financial success. And as our economy continues to grow, it is in part thanks to Minnesotans investing their time, talent, energy, and money in their futures in this state. We must not forget, however, that we must continue our work to eliminate disparities that still exist so that more Minnesotans can have more opportunities to succeed as well. In preparing for today, I spent a good deal of time considering how did we get eight straight forecasts showing positive balances in a row. And let me assure you that this string of eight is not by luck or by chance. Minnesota's four years of balanced budgets were achieved through the hard work and dedicated oversight of Governor Mark Dayton and his brand of sound fiscal management, and that is structural balance. Strictly speaking, structural ba balance occurs in a budget when revenues are growing faster than expenditures. A truly structurally balanced budget is one that supports financial sustainability for multiple years into the future. Today, we are forecasting structural balance for the next four years. Structural balance has been the brand of Governor Dayton since the day of his administration, acting as a guiding principle to ensure that our financial foundation remains solid, and it has worked. Despite changes in leadership around the Capitol, changes in the minority party and majority party, Governor Dayton and his commitment to structural balance is the one constant that we've seen putting these eight forecasts in a row. If you look across the nation, we are seeing a number of states struggling with, bu with budget difficulties. 26 states have or still need to close budget gaps for the current fiscal year. 11 states are already projecting budget shortfalls for fiscal year 2018. Meanwhile, Minnesota continues to grow. Not only is our economy continuing to grow at a moderate pace, our quality of life continues to be among the best in the nation. In fact, today, Minnesota is being named as the third best state in the nation by U.S. News and World Report. In making their determination, U.S. News looked at more than 60 metrics and thousands of data points. Minnesota ranks at the top of the pack among states for economic opportunities, affordability, infrastructure, access to health care, educational attainment, and the highest labor force participation in the nation. Time after time, Minnesota is singled out for national recognition. Just last year, Minnesota was named the best state for job creation by Gallup, as well as the second best run state according to 24-7 Wall Street. These accolades align with Minnesota's core values. Minnesotans expect value for their investments, and maintaining a structurally balanced budget is the way to ensure Minnesotans continue to enjoy the quality of life that they expect and essential services that they know and deserve. But we must, for, we must also talk about caution. We first projected a positive balance in November of 2013. That was a start of rewriting our economics and budget story. 
We reversed a $6 billion deficit that created this administration in 2011, and we now are looking at a $1.65 billion positive balance today. While we stand here today recognizing our balanced budget, we must recognize how quickly balances can turn into deficits. Back in 1999, Minnesota had large positive balances. A decision was made to implement across the board permanent income tax cuts. Many thought with the state's positive balance, Minnesota could afford the tax rate cuts. But budgeting is not just about the current budget. It is also about projecting for the future. The, in, the income tax rate cuts made just before the dot-com bubble burst in, tw in 2000. The state's positive balance turned into deficits nine out of 11 following years. I imagine today that we will hear from a number of leaders from the House and Senate today stand up and call for large tax cuts. The, and we need to be careful about whether we can afford them. Calling to repeat what we did in 1999 99 must be cautiously avoided. It did not work in 1999, and it will not work now. If I sound cautious, it is because there are a number of unique risks in this forecast that could amplify the impacts of any impacts of wrong budget decisions. Before Dr. Kumblakidis describes the risk in detail, I want to mention two right up front. First, that the U.S. is in the fourth longest economic expansion on record, and second, Considerable uncertainty remains about which proposed U.S. economic policy changes will be enacted in the near future and what their impact will be on the economy. Until those changes become clearer, the, their impact on the economy remains sources of risk for this forecast. We must keep these risks in mind as we prepare the budget for the next biennium. We want to maintain the state's strong financial health and be positioned to weather unexpected changes and uncertainty. As for next steps, I just want to mentioned that as a result of the forecast, the MMB will analyze and revise the budget proposals that the governor made on January 24th. We will revisit those expenditures and those revenue estimates. The Department of Revenue will reprice the tax bill that the governor proposed, and all those repricing and, and revisiting will be done in the next week or so. So Governor Dayton will have any supplemental budget changes in the first part of March. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Klumbakidis. Thank you. So I'm going to start by talking about the U.S. economic outlook, then I'm gonna to move to Minnesota's economy, and finally to the changes in our revenue forecast. The first slide shows the annual percentage change in U.S. real GDP, both the history and the forecast by Minnesota's macroeconomic consulting firm IHS. The dark bars show IHS's February 2017 outlook, the one that informs the current Minnesota forecast, and the light bars show, show their November outlook. The chart shows that the outlook for U.S. economic growth has improved since the November forecast. The economic data coming in since we released our uh, forecast in December has been mostly positive, showing improvements in personal income, business spending on equipment and investment, I'm sorry, business spending on equipment and structures, employment and consumer spending. In addition to that positive economic news, IHS has incorporated into their baseline outlook federal fiscal stimulus in the form of lower individual and corporate income tax rates and increased, increased infrastructure spending. Uh, and those are expected to be, in, within this outlook, they're expected to be enacted this year and ex are expected to boost economic growth starting in 2018 and continuing through our forecast period. You can see that boost to, to 2018 growth in uh, the chart. IHS has slightly increased their forecast for economic growth in 2017 this year from 2.2% in November's outlook to 2.3% in February. But regarding 2018, Higher forecasts for real consumer spending, and that's buoyed by that expected fiscal stimulus, and business capital purchases offset an increased drag from net exports to raise 2018 growth forecast from 2.2% in November to 2.7% in February. The next slide, I'm sorry, I went too far. Uh, the next slide explains part of that forecast change. Uh, the, this slide shows forecast comparison for real consumer spending growth. Consumer spending is expected to remain the primary source of growth in the economy. In this outlook, real consumer spending is expected to grow 3.2% in 2018, compared to 2.5% in the November outlook. 
The faster growth continues through the forecast period with 2019 consumer spending uh, growing 2.9% in this forecast compared to 2.4% in November. Uh, consumer spending is expected to be supported by improvements in employment, in earnings, and household wealth. And those household wealth improvements in turn are due to increases in home prices and increases in the stock market. So those incre the increases in household wealth are expected to stimulate consumer spending. But on top of those positive economic factors, as I said, the February U.S. outlook assumes lower U.S. personal tax rates and new infrastructure spending spread over 10 years. And that's expected to fuel real consumer spending growth starting in 2018. You'll see the stronger consumer spending growth reflected in our sales tax forecast. Before I move to the Minnesota economy, I want to add to Commissioner Franz's caution that considerable uncertainty remains about uh, U.S. economic policy and which changes will be enacted and what their impact will be on the economy. At this time, IHS, the macro uh, consulting firm, feels there's not enough clarity regarding changes to trade policy, immigration policy, health care policy, regulatory policy, and business investment incentives to incorporate those into the outlook. Until those changes become more clear, their impact on key economic sectors, including financial services, manufacturing, international trade, and healthcare, remain sources of forecast risk. So they have felt that there's enough clarity to incorporate the lower tax rates and the infrastructure spending. They don't feel there's enough clarity to incorporate uh, other economic policy changes yet. And even aside from U.S. policy uncertainty, there are risks inherent in this forecast that you also heard about from the commissioner. The rate of U.S. economic growth in this forecast is below the 3.1 percent average annual real GDP growth that we, ex that we had prior to the uh, Great Recession. Slow growth makes the economy more vulnerable to shocks, reducing its capacity to weather uh, an unexpected event. And the current economic expansion is now into its eighth year, well beyond the average length of post-war U.S. expansions. So the longer the economic cycle gets, the riskier the bet becomes that it will continue. Minnesota's economy uh, continues its moderate growth path. The state continues to add jobs at a steady rate, keeping the unemployment rate below the U.S. rate. Robust demand for workers together with low unemployment have created a tight labor market, putting upward pressure on wages. Statewide, there are as many job vacancies as there are job seekers, and recent months have seen increases in both average number of weekly hours worked by private sector employees and their average hourly earnings. The chart shows annual growth in total Minnesota uh, wage and salary income. Uh, this is like adding up all the payrolls of the state of Minnesota and then seeing how that grows. So as long as there, it's above zero, that number is growing, that the total wage and salary income is growing. And those numbers can grow if we have more people working, so that's employment growth, or if average wages per worker increase, that's average wage growth. And in our forecast, both of those things are growing, both employment and average, average earnings. So we now expect slightly higher wage and salary income growth over the forecast period than we had projected in November. We expect wages per worker to pick up, and combined, combining that with moderate employment growth, uh, we expect to see total wage and salary income to grow between 4.7 and 5.2% per year over the forecast period. Our revenue forecast appears on the, this table. On the left is our new revenue forecast for the current biennium along with the dollar amount changes um, from the prior uh, estimate. And on the right is the same for the uh, next biennium. Total general fund revenues for the current biennium are now forecast to be $75 million more than the November 16 forecast adjusted for recent law changes. So we have adjusted the, the left-hand side, the um, November 16 forecast for Chapter 1 concerning federal conformity and Chapter 2 providing health care premium relief. Higher expected individual income and slightly higher corporate income tax revenue more than offsets lower expected sales, state general property, and other revenue. The current forecast for 2018-19, the next biennium, uh, is $321 million more than the November forecast adjusted for law changes. The increased forecast arises primarily from higher expected growth in economic activity. So specifically for the, regarding the income tax, that's being influenced by higher expected growth in wages and in non-wage income. On uh, the sales tax, that's being influenced by higher expected taxable sales. And for corporate, uh, the corporate tax, that's being influenced by higher expected corporate profits. 
finally, I want to reemphasize the risks to this forecast. There's significant policy uncertainty uh, regarding U.S. economic policy. Some of that may be clarified in coming months, but some of that, that uncertainty is likely to persist for some time. Global growth will continue to affect Minnesota businesses that export manufactured goods, agricultural commodities, iron ore, and changes in trade policy will have an impact on them. In this outlook, inflation is expected to gradually increase from what have been very low rates. Uh, but if prices accelerate more quickly than the Federal Reserve pr prefers, they might act, and that could lead to a different outcome for the economy than what is currently forecast. And I've talked about the economy being an uh, economy that's in a low, uh, long, low growth expansion being vulnerable to shocks. And uh, finally, for the next biennium, we are forecasting out 28 uh, months. None of the revenues for the next biennium obviously have been collected, and a lot can change in two and a half years. So I'll pass it over to Budget Director Kelly. Good morning. I am going to speak to the expenditure changes in this forecast and then uh, put the spending and revenue together to speak to the budget outlook for our budget horizon. So if you look at the bottom line on the table up on the screen, you can see that there's a very small change in spending with this forecast compared to our previous estimates. A uh, $12 million reduction in fiscal years 16-17, $156 million increase in the next biennium. In all four years of our forecast period, the growth in education spending increases. You can see $24 million this biennium, $95 million next biennium. We have better, more accurate data on student counts, which are higher than we had projected. And in addition, special education costs have grown in this past year which increases our estimates for the forecast period. Both of these increases are offset by somewhat lower poverty concentration estimates, which lower spending in some areas of education. And this is a trend we have seen in several forecasts. So overall, a net increase in education spending in both biennia. Health and Human Services spending has been lowered in the current biennium by 42 million, you can see on the screen, but increased in the next biennium by 73 million. In the current biennium, we continue to see the average cost of care for home and community-based services and some wavered services decline with their growing enrollment. This is a trend we saw in November that we're seeing continue into this forecast and add additional lower spending. In addition, enrollment has been lowered in the basic health care programs for this fiscal year and in the next few fiscal years as well. Health care spending increases in the next biennium by 73 million as the cost of care grows. There are several reasons for the cost growth. One is the exit of Medica from the state health care contract. 300,000 families with children and adults without children will need to move to other plans on the state contract. And this will increase the average payments and drive up our health care costs for public health care programs. This change is in addition to an overall increase in the average cost of care for health care. And this is a basic trend we're seeing in actual costs in fiscal year 16. And it's driving our costs up in future years. Finally, there are savings that we had anticipated with more frequent enrollment verification called periodic data matching. And those that action is being delayed with this forecast due to implementation changes, and so those savings are not being realized in this forecast. So if we move forward and take a look at the budget outcome for each biennia, here we see fiscal year 16 and 17, which is our current biennium, and we only have five months left to go on this biennium. We continue to project a surplus increasing to $743 million from $656 million in our earlier estimates. $75 million of ad additional revenue that Dr. Kolomakitis spoke of and $12 million of lower spending net together to make a $87 million change. For our current next biennium, Fiscal years 18 and 19, this is the budget period we are going to be planning for with this legislative session. The balance has improved here as well by 250 million. 321 million of additional revenues are offset by 156 million of additional spending. That nets to the 250. 
And finally, looking into fiscal years 20 and 21, our planning estimates have improved as well. The trends from fiscal year 18-19 continue into 20 and 21 with a more sizable bump in revenue, which increases our average annual revenue growth to 4% over the four-year time frame. Spending growth continues as well, but at a slower pace, only 2.7%. So we have structural balance improving in both biennia, but our inflationary pressures also increase with CPI estimates as high as 2.7% in this forecast. That's the highest inflation estimate we've seen in a couple of forecasts. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Commissioner France. As Dr. Klumbakidis mentioned, there are a lot of risks associated with this forecast. <clears throat> U.S. policy uncertainty, inflation, the long expansion, or some of the risks included. We must remain prudent in our budget decisions. Since taking office, Governor Dayton has really tried to make sure that we maintain structural balance budgeting, and this proof is in today's forecast. Eight straight forecasts showing positive balances. If you add to that to restore AAA rating, it's a budgeting brand that is really one we can trust. And we need to maintain the solid financial foundation as we make important decisions now for the future of our state. And with all the risks included in this forecast now, we believe the time is not to veer from our path with structural balance. And with that, we'll take questions. mentions of the word positive in the forecast or the 11 mentions of uncertainty or the nine mentions of risk and the three mentions of caution? Which one? I was going to say yes. Um, but that's a, that's a great question because one of the things that we you really do have to think about with this forecast is we obviously have more resources available. And what better time to have those resources available than in a time of uncertainty? But as you look at the resources available, these are all projections. None of the revenue has been collected for any of these four years that we're talking about. The budget has been enacted for the next budget cycle. So it really is, I think, incumbent upon all of us to look carefully at not just the inflation and the other risks that uh, Dr. Klumbaki just mentioned, but how, if you're going to make spending decisions, if you're going to make taxing decisions, how do you do it in a way that maintains structural balance? We believe that that is the key to making that decision. So that balance of positive and caution is something I think we're going to hear a lot about for the rest of this session. Speaking of the caution, one of the slides says U.S. policy uncertainty. Do you mean political uncertainty? We mean economic, we mean economic and uh, U.S. economic policy and fiscal policy. And do you assign any of that risk to the president in particular? Well, there is only one president now, so I think that would have to be where it would. It's not just the president. It's the entire process in Washington, D.C. Obviously, Congress and the Senate and the, and the House have to agree on any budget proposals or any tax changes, so it's a, it's a complicated uh, situation. Let's open a little bit of discussion of this jump in the CPI numbers and what it means for us. If we were still forecasting the way we did in 2002, this would be showing a deficit. Well, explain what that what that's caused that big change in the CPI and how that affects the Minnesota budget. Well, if you look at the numbers and you see how that the the revenue stream for um, is about forty five billion dollars, and you add inflation as as that number increases, obviously the inflationary effect of that uh, and expenditures that go with that increase dramatically as well. So I think what we're just what we're seeing is that the inflation number we've tried to project inflation for those parts of the budget that don't include inflationary figures. Some of the budget does include inflationary adjustments, but some do not. We've tried to mirror or project what, uh, what elements do not, but it, it's, it's a cautionary. What happens if you don't include infl inflation in a budget is it comes out of agency budgets, and they figure out ways to make cost savings and deal with that inflation on a, on a regular basis. So inflation is an important element to take into consideration. It's something we need to, we need to be cautious of. You're, you're talking about how there's a lot of uncertainty in this projection. Are you quantifying this uncertainty at all, that there's a, a confidence interval or a margin of error in terms of uh, how uh, a range for lawmakers consider that uh, you know, you're reasonably confident that the revenue will be within this, bill, this many billion and this many billion or something like that? Or is it just, a, just an uncertainty? What I'd like to do is have Dr. Klumbakidis explain the different levels of confidence that IHS has in their projections. If you so first, um, we, 
we do release a report on, with, that identifies the um, uncertainty in the forecast, and that's um, due a couple of weeks after the forecast. But regarding the U.S. economic uh, forecast, IHS, their baseline outlook, they assign a 60% probability to their baseline outlook. That's a subjective probability, not a statistical probability. Uh, they assign a 25% probability to a more pessimistic outlook in which trade, a trade war and lack of business confidence uh, helps uh, bring about a, um, a recession in 2018. And then they assign the rest of the probability to a more positive economic outlook in which improved business um, confidence uh, improves uh, investment in equipment and expenditures and raises productivity. Commissioner, you talk about being prudent. Is, are you talking about stashing more money away? You're talking about, be a little more specific on, on what, what, what should be done here. Well, there are a number of issues. When you look at our recent AAA rating in, uh, that we got in, in the summer of, of 2016, one of the, there are a number of ways that we could sort of lose that rating as kind of an indication of what you don't want to do. And one of them would be, for example, to spend more of the budget reserve that we currently have. We have about $2 billion in the budget reserve. $350 million of that is cash, and about $1.6 million is in the budget reserve. So I think the rating agencies would look askance at if we spent more of that. If we also did not do anything regarding the unfunded pension liability. As you know, in the governor's budget proposal on January 24th, he recommended some in serious investments in reducing the unfunded liability of our state pension plans. And I think the other thing is if we eliminated structural balance. So I do think those three elements, if you maintain structural balance, if you deal with the unfunded li pension liability, and if you maintain the budget reserve, those are the kinds of things that other folks outside of Minnesota look to. Uh, in, the other way to, to really deal with the prudence of, of budgeting is looking at the inflation factor that was just mentioned. So trying to leave some money on the bottom line is another way that you can uh, deal with the forward effects of inflation. Do you budget reserves? Do you think you should stay like that? Uh, well, as the uh, chief financial officer, I would always like to see the budget, the uh, budget reserve, filled to its capacity. But I think, as a, co I mean, as a prudent matter, that is something we would like to see. So remember, in this in this forecast, there is no automatic addition to the reserve. In November, the November forecast, if we have a positive balance, 33 percent of that positive balance will go into the reserve automatically by law. That is something that a number of states are now starting to mirror. We've been touted as having one of the, the most sophisticated and smart policies for budget reserves. So we do have that in place, and that is something that we can rely on, too, in November. How about tax cuts? How much room do we have left for tax cuts? There will be a robust appetite in the Republican legislature. Tax cuts are spending. It's like any kind of spending. Does if you're going to propose a tax cut, is it targeted? Is it helping the people you really want to help? And can you afford it in the future? Does it blow a hole in the budget in the future? Those are the questions you ask about any spending and any, and any tax cut. So what kind of room would you suggest there is? Well, I'm, the governor will be reviewing the, the forecast. He'll be reviewing his budget and his tax proposal to decide whether he wants to make any changes in that. I don't know at this time. Should consider leaving money on the bottom line for unanticipated federal costs, for example, picking up a larger share of Medicaid billing? As Dr. Klumbaki just mentioned, the, the, the risk of changes in federal, federal health care policy really was not factored into the, uh, the forecast in terms of when that might happen and how much that might be. You know, it's, it's really, that's just an example of, of those uncertainties that we don't know about that are hard to quantify at this time. And there are other, other areas, other regulations, the trade war potential, uh, and other issues. So I think to the extent that you are concerned about things happening that you don't know about, it always makes sense to leave money on the bottom line. The other thing, though, that Dr. Klumbaki just mentioned is, you know, if the tax bill doesn't happen this year, you know, then, then should you really rely on that potential growth in 2018? If the infrastructure spending does not happen this year or gets started for 2018, should you rely on those estimates of growth. So the budget does rely on these projections, and you know as well as we how much uh, faith you can put in whether they'll happen or not. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of variables in those decisions. Factoring in that some of the risks that you outlined for the Trump administration could result in trade war, et cetera, et cetera, it does kind of sound as though you're saying that Trump's expected policies are a net plus for the state's economy. Is that an accurate way of interpreting what you're saying? 
I'm going to let Dr. Klumbakitis answer that one. Sure. You understand that there's been an um, unevenness in how the pr proposed policies have been incorporated into the forecast. So what the consulting firm thought was they, could, they had the most confidence in is these tax cuts, which are stimulative. That's what fiscal stimulus does. And they're deficit financed. And so they're in the assumption. And so there's no trade-off there. And so that can be positive for, for the economy. Uh, a lot of other policies could have differential effects on the economy, and those simply do not have enough clarity yet to know uh, what, whether or not they should be uh, incorporated into the outlook and what the impact will be. 